Hello and a huge warm welcome to all our New Year 7 starters who will be beginning their St Cuthbert's Roman Catholic High School journey with us in September. My name is Mr Lockett and I will be your Head of Year and it's my job to make sure we're fully prepared for when you do arrive and along with your form tutors to help guide you through what is a very important first year of secondary school. Unfortunately we've not been able to do the usual transition activities we would do in years gone by where you've come to see us and we've got to meet your parents and carers but it's really important to us that you feel part of our school community already. On this we will be uploading a number of different activities to our school Facebook page and also our school website under the transition tab and the first of these is a book follow for the book Cirque de Freak by Darren Sham. Now this may well be a book you study in year 7 and if you want to you can go on to our transition tab download an ebook for Cirque de Freak. However, if you would also prefer, you can watch some videos we're going to upload onto Facebook. These will include a number of members of staff reading different chapters so you can get to familiarise yourself with some of the faces you will see in September. For now, sit back and enjoy this atmospheric and supernatural novel. Hello Year 6, I'm Miss Miller and I'm an English teacher. I am also going to be a Year 7 farm tutor. Today I'm going to be reading the introduction um, to Cirque de Freak. I've always been fascinated by spiders. I used to collect them when I was younger. I spent hours rooting through the dusty old shed at the bottom of our garden, hunting the cobwebs for lurking gate leaded predators. When I found one, I'd bring it in and let it loose in my room. It used to drive my mum mad. Usually the spider would slip away after no more than a day or two, never to be seen again. But sometimes they hung around longer. I had one who made a cobweb above my bed and stood sentry for almost a month. Going to sleep, I used to imagine the spider creeping down, crawling into my mouth, sliding down my throat and laying lots of eggs in my belly. The baby spiders would hatch after a while and eat me alive from the inside out. I loved being scared when I was little. When I was nine, my mum and dad gave me a small tarantula. It wasn't poisonous or very big, but it was the greatest gift I'd ever received. I played with that spider almost every waking hour of the day. Gave it all sorts of treats, flies and cockroaches and tiny worms, spoilt it rotten. Then, one day, I did something stupid. I'd been watching a cartoon in which one of the characters was sucking was sucked up by a vacuum cleaner. No harm came to him. He squeezed out of the bag, dusty and dirty and mad as hell. It was very funny. So funny, I tried it myself with the tarantula. Needless to say, things didn't happen quite like they did in the cartoon. The spider was ripped to pieces. I cried a lot, but it was too late for the tears. My pet was dead. It was my fault and there was nothing I could do about it. My parents nearly hollered the roof down when they found out what I'd done. The tarantula had cost quite a bit of money. They said I was, ir I was an irresponsible fool and from that day on, they never let me have a pet, not even an ordinary garden spider. I started with the tale from the past for two reasons. One will become obvious as this book unfolds. There is another reason. This is a true story. I don't expect you to believe me. I wouldn't believe it myself if I hadn't lived it but it is. Everything I describe in this book happened just as I tell it. The thing is about real life is, when you do something stupid, it normally costs you. In books, the heroes can make as many mistakes as they like. It doesn't matter what they do, because everything co comes good at the end. They'll beat the bad guys and put things right, and everything gets, ends up hunky-dory. In a real life, vacuum cleaners kill spiders. If you cross a busy road without looking, you get whacked by a car. If you fall up out of a tree, you break some bones. Real life's nasty. It's cruel. It doesn't care about the heroes and the happy endings and the way things should be. In real life, bad things happen. People die, fights are lost, evil often wins. I just want to make that clear before I begin. One more thing. My name isn't really Darren Shan. Everything's true in this book, except for names. I've had to change them because, well, by the time you get to the end, you'll understand. I haven't used any real names, not mine, not my sisters, not my friends or teachers, nobody's. I'm not even going to tell you about the name of, 
of my town or country. I daren't. Anyway, that's enough of an introduction. If you're ready, let's begin. If this was a made up story, it would begin at night with a storm blowing and owls hooting and rattling noises under the bed. But this is a real story. So I have to begin where it really started. It started in a toilet. Hello, my name is Mr Duffin. I'm a mathematics teacher at St Cuthbert's Roman Catholic High School. I'm reading chapter one from Darren Sharn's Cirque de Freak book. Hope you enjoy it. I was in the toilet at school sitting down, humming a song. I had my trousers on. I'd come in near the end of English class feeling sick. My teacher, Mr Dalton, is great about things like that. He's smart and knows when you're faking and when you're being serious. He took one look at me when I raised my hand and said I was ill. Then he nodded his head and told me to make for the toilet. Throw it where I was bugging you, Darren, he said. Then get your behind back in here. I wish every teacher was as understanding as Mr Dalton. In the end, I didn't get sick, but still felt quite queasy. So I stayed on the toilet. I heard the bell ring for the end of class and everybody came rushing out on their lunch break. I wanted to join them, but knew Mr Dalton would give out if he saw me in the yard so soon. He doesn't get mad if you trick him, but he goes quiet and he won't speak to you for ages, and that's almost worse than being shouted at. So there I was, humming, watching my watch, waiting. Then I heard someone calling my name. Darren! Hey, Darren! Have you fallen in, or what? I grinned. It was Steve Leppard, my best friend. Steve's real surname was Leonard, but everyone called him Steve Leppard. And not just because the name sounded alike. Steve used to be what my mum calls a wild child. He raised hell wherever he went, got into fights, stolen shops. One day, he was still in a pushchair, he found a sharp stick and prodded passing women with it. No prizes for guessing where he stuck it. He was feared and despised everywhere he went, but not by me. I've been his best friend since Montessori, where we first met. My mum says I was drawn to his wildness, but I just thought he was a great guy to be with. He had a fierce temper and threw scary tantrums when he lost it, but I simply ran away when that happened and came back once he'd calmed down. Steve's reputation had softened over the years. His mum took him to see a lot of good counsellors who taught him how to control himself. But he was still a minor legend in the schoolyard and not someone you messed with, even if you were bigger and older than him. Hey Steve, I called back. I'm in here. I hit the door so that he knew which one I was behind. He hurried over and I opened the door. He smiled when he saw me sitting down with my trousers on. Did you puke? He asked. No, I said. Do you think you're gonna? Maybe, I said. Then I leaned forward all of a sudden and made a sick noise. Blah! But Steve Leppard knew me too well to be fooled. Give my boots a polish while you're down there, he said, and laughed when I pretended to spit on his shoes and rubbed them with a sheet of toilet paper. Did I miss anything in class? I asked, sitting up. Nah, he said. The usual crap. Did you do your history homework? I asked. Don't have to be done till tomorrow, does it? He asked, getting worried. Steve's always forgetting about homework. The day after tomorrow, I told him. Oh, he said, relaxing. Even better. I thought... He stopped and frowned. Hold on, he said. Today's Thursday. The day after tomorrow would be... Ha ha, got you, I yelled, punching him on the shoulder. Ow, he shouted. That hurt. He rubbed his arm, but I could tell he wasn't really hurt. Are you coming out? He asked. I thought I'd stay in here and admire the view, I said, leaning back on the toilet seat. Quit messing, he said. We're five one down when I came in. We're probably six or seven down now. We need you. He was talking about football. We play a game every lunchtime. My team normally wins, but we'd lost a lot of our best players. Dave Morgan had broke his leg. Sam White transferred to another school when his family moved. And Danny Curtin had stopped playing football in order to spend lunchtime hanging out with Sheila Lee, the girly fancies. Idiot. I'm our best full forward. There are better defenders and midfielders and Tommy Jones is the best goalkeeper in the whole school. But I'm the only one who can stand up front and score four or five times a day without fail. OK, I said standing. I'll save you. I've scored a hat-trick every day this week. It would be a pity to stop now. 
we passed the older guys smoking around the sinks as usual and hurried to my locker so I could change into my trainers. I used to have a great pair which I won in a writing competition but the laces snapped a few months ago and the rubber along the side started to fall off and then my feet grew. The pair I have now are okay but they're not the same. We were 8-3 down when I got on the pitch. It wasn't a real pitch, just a long stretch of yard with painted goalposts at either end. Whoever painted them was a right idiot. He put the crossbar too high at one end and too low at the other. Never fear, hot shot Shan is here, I shouted as I ran onto the pitch. A lot of players laughed or groaned, for I could see my teammates picking up and our opponents growing worried. I made a great start and scored two goals inside a minute. It looked like we might come back to draw or win, but time ran out. If I had arrived earlier, we'd be, have been OK, but the bell rang just as I was hitting my stride, and we lost 9-7. As we were leaving the pitch, Alan Morris ran into the yard, panting and red-faced. They're my three best friends, Steve Leppard, Tommy Jones and Alan Morris. We must be the oddest four people in the whole world, because only one of us, Steve, has a nickname. Look what I found, Alan yelled, waving a soggy piece of paper around under our noses. What is it? Tommy asked, trying to grab it. It's, Alan began, but stopped when Mr Dalton shouted at us. You four, inside, he roared. We're coming, Mr Dalton, Steve roared back. Steve is Mr Dalton's favourite and gets away with stuff that the rest of us couldn't do. Like when he uses swear words sometimes in his stories. If I put in some of the words Steve has, I'd have been kicked out long ago. But Mr Dalton has a soft spot for Steve because he's special. Sometimes he's brilliant in class and gets everything right, or other times he can't even spell his own name. Mr Dalton says he's a bit of an idiot savant, which means he's a stupid genius. Anyway, even though he's Mr Dalton's pet, not even Steve can get away with turning up late for class. So whatever Alan had, it would have to wait. We trudged back to class, sweaty and tired after the game, and began our next lesson. Little did I know that Alan's mysterious piece of paper was to change my life forever, for the worse. Hello everybody, my name's Mrs Hollingworth and I work in the English department. Chapter 2 We had Mr Dalton again after lunch for history. We were studying World War II. I wasn't too keen on it, but Steve thought it was great. He loved anything to do with killing and war. He often said he wanted to be a mercenary soldier, one who fights for money when he grew up. And he meant it. We had maths after history, and, and incredibly, Mr Dalton for a third time. Our usual maths teacher was off sick, so others had been filling in for him as best they could all day. Steve was in seventh heaven. His favourite teacher, three classes in a row. It was the first time we'd had Mr Dalton for maths, so Steve started showing off, telling him where we were in the book, explaining some of the trickier problems as though speaking to a child. Mr Dalton didn't mind. He was used to Steve and knew exactly how to handle him. Normally Mr Dalton runs a tight ship. His classes are fun, but we always come out of them having learned something. But he wasn't very good at math. He tried hard, but we could tell he was in over his head. And while he was busy trying to come to grips with things, his head buried in the maths book, Steve by his side making help, helpful suggestions, the rest of us began to fidget and talk softly to each other and pass notes around. I sent a note to Alan, asking to see the mysterious piece of paper he brought in. He refused at first to pass it around, but I kept sending notes and finally he gave in. Tommy sits just two seats over her from him. So he got it first. He opened it up and began studying it. His face lit up while he was reading and his jaw slowly dropped. When he passed it on to me, having read it three times, I soon saw why. It was a flyer, an advertising pamphlet for some, of, for some sort of travelling circus. There was a picture of a wolf's head at the top. The wolf had its mouth open and saliva was dripping from its teeth. At the bottom were pictures of a spider and a snake and they looked vicious too. Just beneath the wolf in big red capital letters were the words Cirque de Freak. Under that in smaller writing. For one week only, Cirque de Freak. See, 
Steve and Cesra, the Twisting Twins, the Snake Boy, the Wolfman, Gertha T, Larton Krepsley and his Performing Spider, Madame Octa, Alexander Ribs, the Bearded Lady, Hans Hans, Ramus Two Bellies, World's Fattest Man. Beneath all that was an address where you could buy tickets and find out where the show was playing. And right at the bottom, just above the pictures of the snake and spider, not for the faint hearted, certain reservations apply. Cirque de Freak, I muttered softly to myself. Cirque was French for circus. Circus of Freaks? Was this a freak show? It looked like it. I began reading the flyer again, immersed in the drawings and descriptions of the performers. In fact, I was so immersed, I forgot about Mr Dalton. I only remembered him when I realised the room was silent. I looked up and saw Steve standing alone at the head of the class. He stuck out his tongue at me and grinned, feeling the hairs on the back of my neck prickle. I stared over my shoulder and there was Mr Dalton standing behind me reading the flyer, lips tight. What is this? he snapped, snatching the paper from my hands. It's an advert, sir, I answered. Where'd you get it? he asked. He looked really angry. I'd never seen him this worked up. Where'd you get it? he asked again. I licked my lips nervously. I didn't know how to answer. I wasn't going to drop Alan in the soup and I knew he wouldn't own up by himself. Even Alan's best friends know he's not the bravest in the world. But my mind was stuck in low gear and I couldn't think of a reasonable lie. Luckily, Steve stepped in. Sir, it's mine, he said. Yours? Mr Dalton blinked slowly. I found it near the bus stop, sir. Some old guy threw it away. I thought it looked interesting, so I picked it up. I was going to ask you about it later at the end of class. Oh, Mr Dalton tried not to look flattered but I could tell he was. That's different. Nothing wrong with an inquisitive mind. Sit down Steve. Steve sat. Mr Dalton stuck a bit of blue tack on the flyer and pinned it to the blackboard. Long ago, he said tapping the flyer, there used to be real freak shows. Greedy con men crammed, malformed people in cages and... Sir, what's malformed mean? somebody asked. Someone who doesn't look ordinary, Mr Dalton said. A person with three arms or two noses, somebody with no legs, somebody very short or very tall. The con men put these poor people, who were no different to you or me, except in looks, on display and called them freaks. They charged the public to stare at them and invited them to laugh and tease. They treated the so-called freaks like animals, paid them little, beat them, dressed them in rags, never allowed them to wash. That's cruel, sir, Delena Price, a girl near the front said. Yes, he agreed. Freak sh shows were cruel, monstrous creations. That's why I got angry when I saw this. He tore down the flyer. They were banned years ago, but every so often you'll hear a rumour that they're still going strong. Do you think the Cirque de Freak is a real freak show? I asked. Mr Dalton studied the flyer again, then shook his head. I doubt it, he said. Probably just a cruel hoax. Still, he added, if it was real, I hope nobody here would dream of going. Oh, no, sir, we all said quickly, because freak shows were terrible, he said. They pretended to be like proper circuses, but they were cesspits of evil. Anybody who went to one would be just as bad as the people running it. You'd have to be really twisted to want to go to one of those, sir, Steve agreed. And then he looked at me, winked and mouthed the words, we're going. Chapter 3. Steve persuaded Mr. Dalton to let him keep the flyer. He said he wanted it for his bedroom wall. Mr. Dalton wasn't going to give it to him, but then he changed his mind. He cut off the address at the bottom before handing it over. After school, the four of us, me, Steve, Alan, Morris and Tommy Jones, gathered in the yard and studied the glossy flyer. It's got to be a fake, I said. Why, Alan asked. They don't allow freak shows anymore, I told him. Wolfmen and snake boys were outlawed years ago. Mr. Dalton said so. It's not a fake, Alan insisted. Where'd you get it? Tommy asked. 
I stole it, Alan said softly. It belongs to my big brother. Alan's big brother was Tony Morris, who used to be the school's biggest bully until he got thrown out. He's huge and mean and ugly. You stole from Tony? I gasped. Have you got a death wish? He won't know it was me, Alan said. He had it in a pair of trousers that mom threw in the washing machine. I stuck a blank piece of paper in when I took this out. He'll think the ink got washed off. Smart, Steve nodded. Where did Tony get it? I asked. There was a guy passing them out in the alley, Alan said. One of the circus performers, a Mr. Krepsley. The one with the spider, Tommy asked. Yeah, Alan answered. Only he didn't have the spider with him. It was night and Tony was on his way back from the pub. Tony's not old enough to get served in the pub, but hangs around with all the guys who buy drinks for him. Mr. Krepsley handed the paper to Tony and told him they were there a traveling freak show who put on secret performances in town and cities across the world. He said you have to have a flyer to buy a ticket and they only give them to people they trust. You're not supposed to tell anyone else about the show. I only found out because Tony was in high spirits, the way he gets when he drinks and couldn't keep his mouth shut. How much are the tickets, Steve asked. 15 pounds each, Alan said. 15 pounds, we all shouted. Nobody's going to pay 15 pounds to see a bunch of freaks, Steve snorted. I would, I said. Me too, Tommy agreed. And me, Alan added. Sure, Steve said, but we don't have 15 pounds to throw away. So it's academic, isn't it? What does academic mean, Alan asked. It means we can't afford the tickets. So it doesn't matter if we would buy them or not, Steve explained. It's easy to say you would buy something if you know you can't. How much do we have, Alan asked. Tuppence, her penny. I laughed. It was something my dad often said. I'd love to go, Tommy said sadly. It sounds great. He studied the picture again. Mr. Dalton didn't think too much of it, Alan said. That's what I mean, Tommy said. If sir doesn't like it, it must be super. Anything that adults hate is normally brilliant. Are we sure we don't have enough? I asked. Maybe they have discounts for children. I don't think children are allowed in, Alan said. But he told me how much he had anyways. Five pounds 70. I've got 12 pounds exactly, Steve said. I have six pounds 85 pence, Tommy said. And I have eight pounds 25, I told them. That's more than 30 pounds in all, I said, adding it up in my head. We get our pocket money tomorrow. If we pull our, well, the tickets are nearly sold out, Alan interrupted. The first show was yesterday. It finishes Tuesday. If we go, it'll have to be tomorrow night or Saturday because our parents won't let us out any other night. The guy who gave Tony the flyer said the tickets for both these nights were almost gone. We'd have to buy them tonight. Well, so much for that, I said, putting on a brave face. Maybe not, Steve said. My mom keeps a wad of money in a jar at home. I could borrow some and put it back when we get our pocket money. You mean steal, I asked. I mean borrow, he snapped. It's only stealing if you don't put it back. What do you say? How would we get the tickets, Tommy asked. It's a school night, we wouldn't be let out. I can sneak out, Steve said, I'll buy them. But Mr. Dalton snipped off the address, I reminded him. How will you know where to go? I memorized it, he grinned. Now, are we gonna stand here all night making up excuses or are we gonna go for it? We looked at each other then, one by one, nodded silently. Right, Steve said. We hurry home, grab our money, and meet back here. Tell your parents you forgot a book or something. 
We'll lump the money together and I'll add the rest from the pot at home. What if you can't steal? I mean, borrow the money, I asked. He shrugged. Then the deal's off? But well, we won't know unless we try. Now hurry. With that, he sprinted away. Moments later, making up our minds, Tommy, Alan and me ran too. Hi everyone, I'm Mr. Trainer, and I teach pretty much everything at St. Cuthbert's. Okay, so chapter four. The freak show was all I could think about that night. I tried forgetting it, but couldn't. Not even when I was watching my favorite TV shows. It sounded so weird, a snake boy, a wolf man, a performing spider. I was especially excited by the spider. Mum and dad didn't know if anything was up, but Annie did. Annie is my younger sister. She can be a bit annoying, but most of the time she's cool. She doesn't run to mum, telling tales of how I misbehave, and she knows how to keep a secret. What's wrong with you? She asked after dinner. We were alone in the kitchen washing up. Nothing's wrong, I said. Yes, there is, she said. You've been behaving funny all night. I knew she'd keep asking until she got the truth. So I told her about the freak show. It sounds great, she agreed. But there's no way you'd get in. Why not? I asked. I bet they don't let children in. It sounds like a grown-up kind of show. They probably won't let a brat in like you, I said nastily. But me and the others would be okay. That upset her, so I apologised. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't mean that. I'm just annoyed because you're probably right. Annie, I'd give anything to go. I've got a makeup kit I could lend you, she said. You can draw on wrinkles and stuff. It'll make you look older. I smiled and gave her a big hug, which is something I don't do very often. Thanks, sis, I said. But it's okay. If we get in, we get in. If we don't, we don't. We didn't say much after that. We finished drain and hurried into the TV room. Dad got back home a few minutes later. He works on building sites all over the place, so he's often late. He's grumpy sometimes, but he was in a good mood that night and swung Annie round in a circle. Anything exciting happened today? He asked, after he said hello to mum and given her a kiss. I scored another hat-trick at lunch, I told him. Really? He said. That's great, well done. We turned the TV down while dad was eating. He likes peace and quiet when he eats and often asks us questions or tells us about his day at work. Later, mum went to her room to work on her stamp albums. She's a serious stamp collector. I used to collect too, when I was younger, and more easily amused. I popped up to see if she had any new stamps for the exotic animals or spiders on them. She hadn't. While I was there, I sounded her out about the freak shows. Mum, I said, have you ever been to a freak show? A what? she asked, concentrating on the stamps. A freak show, I repeated. Like bearded ladies and wolf men and snake boys. She looked up at me and blinked. A snake boy? She asked. What on earth is a snake boy? It's a... Uh... I stopped when I realised I didn't know. Well, that doesn't matter, I said. Have you ever been to one? She shook her head. No, they're illegal. If they weren't, I said, and one came to town, would you go? No, she said, shivering. Those sorts of things frighten me. Besides... I don't think it would be fair on the people in the show. Well, what do you mean? I asked. Well, how would you like it? She said. If you were stuck in a cage for people to look at. Well, I'm not a freak. I said huffily. I know, she laughed and kissed the top of my head. You're my little angel. Mum, don't. I grumbled, wiping my forehead with my hand. Silly, she smiled. But I imagine if you had two heads or four arms and somebody stuck you on show for people to make fun of you. You wouldn't like that, would you? No, I said, shuffling my feet. Anyway, what's all this about a freak show? She asked. Have you been staying up late, watching horror films? No, I said, because you know your dad doesn't like you watching. I wasn't staying up late, okay, I shouted. It's really annoying when parents don't listen. Okay, Mr Grumper, she said. No need to shout. If you don't like my company, go downstairs and help your father weed the garden. I didn't want to go, but mum was upset that I'd shouted, I was shouted at her. So I left and went down to the kitchen. Dad was coming back and spotted me. So this is where you've been hiding, he chuckled. Too busy to help the old man tonight? I was on my way, I told him. Too late, he said, taking off his wellies. I'm finished. I watched him putting on his slippers, his huge feet. 
take size 12 shoes. When I was younger, he used to stand, he used to stand me on his feet and walk me around. It was like being on two long skateboards. What are you doing now? I asked. Writing, he said. My dad has pen pals all over the world. America, Australia, Russia and China. He says he likes to keep in touch with his global neighbours. Don't think it's just an excuse to go into his study for a nap. And he was playing with dolls and stuff. I asked if she wanted to come to my room for a game of bed tennis, using a sock for a ball and shoes for rackets. But she was too busy arranging her dolls for a pretend picnic. I went to my room and dragged down my comics. I had loads of pure comics. Superman, Batman, Spider-Man and Spawn. Spawn's my favourite. He's a superhero who used to be a demon in hell. Some of the Spawn comics are quite scary, but that's why I love them. I spent the rest of the night reading comics and putting them in order. I used to swap with Tommy, who has a huge collection, but he kept spilling drinks on the covers and crumbs between the pages, so I stopped. Most nights I go to bed by 10, but mum and dad forgot about me, and I stayed up until nearly half past 10. Then dad saw the light in my room and came up. He pretended to be cross, but he wasn't really. Dad doesn't mind too much if I stay up late. Mum's the one who nags about that. Bed, he said, or I'll never be able to wake you up in the morning. Just a minute, Dad, I told him. Well, I'll put my comics away and brush my teeth. OK, he said, but make it quick. I stuck the comics into their box and stuffed it back up on the shelf over my bed. I put them up in pyjamas and went to brush my teeth. I took my time, brushed slowly, and it was almost 11 when I got into bed. I lay back smiling. I felt very tired and I knew I'd fall asleep in a couple of seconds. The last thing I thought about was the Cirque de Freak. I wondered what a snake boy looked like and how long the bearded lady's beard was and what Hans Hans and Gertha teeth did. Most of all, I dreamed about the spider.